Chapter 4 Sailor's Love Part 2 Pashone in its early days had gained the trust of the people by fighting against the abuses of older organizations. This was all for show. The founder, Diavolo, simply saw it as an effective way to broaden his power quickly. Once he had an area under his thumb, the drug trade he had claimed to be fighting would be an open market for his own drugs. But dealing drugs requires connections in the countries where the raw materials are grown, and importing it is no easy matter. There were too many hurdles for an upstart crime syndicate to clear. But just as a young black man named Frank Lucas had used the Vietnam War to smuggle heroin into America using military transport free of customs inspections, forming direct connections to jungle farms through enlisted soldiers, Pashone's drug trade was launched to great success thanks to a special trick all their own. The trick's name was Manic Depression. Massimo Volpe's stand. The simplest way to put it is that his stand let him create narcotics, Morolo explained. He was briefing Fugo and Sheila E on what little he'd been told. Even Giorno didn't know he existed, but after Bucciolati killed Diavolo, everything he'd been hiding started surfacing, including the true nature of his narcotics business. Ask any other syndicate and they'll look baffled, tell you they have no clue how he's importing the drugs. He'll tell you the stuff just shows up on the street like magic. Cause it is. Volpe's using his stand to turn salt water or rock salt into drugs. I heard rumors that Pashone's drugs weren't the same as everyone else's. That they were fresh and expired quickly. That rumor would be true. Once a stand's effect expires, the drugs turn back into ordinary salt. And that time limit was perfect for keeping the business under control. If someone tried to stock up on it, or water it down, it was obvious. Part of the reason Diavolo got so much power so quickly was that he had a knack for finding out who was going to betray him and take action against them. At least, until Giorno found out. Risotto's team tried to take Diavolo out, assuming they'd be able to take over his import route and monopolize his business. Those idiots had no idea what was really going on. There was no route! Even if they'd won, they'd have had nothing to show for it. They were total scumbags. Good riddance. Sheila E. snarled. Fugo raised an eyebrow. She sounded a little too heated. Morolo picked up on it as well. What, you have something against them? He asked. For a second, Sheila E.'s eyes went frosty. I joined Pashone to kill someone on that team. It took a long time for me to track him down, but I knew he was part of that team. A man named Iluzo. Less a man than a filthy scumbag demon piece of shit from hell. Iluzo? What'd he ever do to you? Morolo grinned. He killed my sister. Sheila E hissed. Morolo's grin faded. Sheila E gave him a nasty smile. My only living relative. Clara raised me after my parents died. After he killed her, I came looking for him, ready to die to get to him. But he died before I could. It was all for nothing. But you know what Giorno said to me? He said these words. Iluzo died in the worst way imaginable. He suffered more than you can imagine. We watched it happen. I don't know if this will help at all, but in the 30 seconds it took him to die, he regretted every decision he'd made in life, including killing your sister. It felt like the sun had come out from behind a cloud and shone down on me. All those years I'd spent on my quest for revenge, telling myself that if I killed Iluzo, my sister could rest in peace, but secretly wondering if it was all actually for me, if it was just a selfish little vendetta. That thought preyed upon me, but Iluzo paid for killing Clara. Justice won. And I owed Giorno everything. I would do anything to pay him back for that. I no longer need worry about anything. There was a light in her eyes, like she was bewitched. It was less like she was grateful, and more like the spirit of her dead sister had possessed her. Wait, 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 Morolo said, scowling. So you joined us for revenge? That's why you worked as a messenger for the assassin team. Then you basically joined us to betray us, 
You think we can trust you after you tell us something like that? I fully intended to get the boss's permission before killing Iluzo. I don't consider that a betrayal. But you'd never spoken to Giorno at the time. You didn't even know Diavolo wasn't the boss. Well... This is bad. You're a liability. Like a horse with blinders, can't see the big picture. We can't afford that against these guys. Sheila E looked sullen. I'm more useful than you, she muttered. Marola ignored this and just stared at her suspiciously. Throughout all this, Fugo said not a word. He had no idea what to say. Diavolo had ordered him and his friends to fight the assassin team. Fugo himself had fought Iluzo alongside Abaccio and Giorno. If I said as much, she wouldn't believe it. And Giorno and Abaccio did most of the work, I just finished him off. I don't know how good I really was. He was already powerless. He didn't need Sheila E to point that out. So, do we know where Volpe is? He asked, trying to change the subject. Murolo glared at him. This'll never do, he said. It simply won't do. You simply aren't showing me the respect I deserve. Mister told me to do what I could. Orders from on high made it clear I was in charge, so maybe I should just let it pass, but it irks me. I think I'd better teach you a lesson. Murolo pulled something out of the inside pocket of his suit. It was a deck of cards. No box, just the cards. He began shuffling expertly, cutting the cards like a magician. He put them on his shoulder and slid them down to his hand, then spread them out on the table and flipped them all back to front in a single motion. What are you doing? Fugo asked. Murolo ignored him and continued shuffling. At length, he took off his hat and shot the cards into it. Then, he flipped it over onto the table, the cards still inside. Murolo began imitating a drum roll with his mouth, beckoning the two of them expectantly. They just stared at him blankly. Applaud, he whispered. If you don't applaud, they won't respond. Awkwardly, Fugo clapped his hands. Sheila E did not. Murolo scowled at her, but let it pass. He began making the drum roll sound again and slowly raised his hat. The cards were underneath, but like magic, they had arranged themselves into a tower. A tower seven times taller than his hat. Marolo put the hat back on his head, and the tower began moving with a life of its own. Each card sprouted tiny legs and arms and began spinning. We are the Watchtower Troop! The cards chanted like a scene from a children's cartoon. All along the Watchtower. This was Canolo Marolo's stand. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. There are 53 of us here to entertain you. I am the Joker, and I'll be your host for this evening. Hi, Joker Joker. You always did like to joke around. These are the spades. If they get their dander up, there's nothing they can do. As stubborn as they are, deadly. Oh, spades, spades, whatever that symbol is supposed to be. And those are the hearts. Their hearts inspire envy, and their envy inspires fear. Ha ha! Hearts! Hearts! Actually kind of gross if you think about it. And these would be the clubs. They look like clovers and trust in their luck, which is only 50-50. Ho ho! Clubs! Clubs! You all have three leaves, yet four leaf clovers are so very common. And last but not least, the diamonds. They're sure that money makes the world go round, and that they are the most valuable. Diamonds, rhinestones are all you need to impress. The cards sang and danced through this whole routine. What the? Fugo whispered. Shut up and watch, Marolo hissed. The cards continued their number. Today we're after Vladimir Kokaki and his narcotics team. Where oh where could they be? Ah, uh, Kokaki, keep that old fart away from me. He was a gangster long before Pashone, a quiet man until you cross him. Then he'll kill you and everyone you know. He helped Diavolo out, but when he died, he and his team went into hiding. All three of them are every bit as insane. Fope, Vittorio, Angelica. Each and every one of them addicted to their own drugs. So? So! They know no pain. You can hit them, it won't work. Oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap! These guys are bad news. The baddest news. So, it's a kind of... Fortune telling, Sheila E said, pointing at the cards. I've heard of stands that can see things that are far away. 
In your case, these cards work like a kind of Ouija board, telling you what you need to know. Nothing so unreliable. My cards tell the truth. Nothing more. Really? They aren't exactly being very specific. Sheila E. frowned. The show, meanwhile, was going off the rails. Crazy people are just dumb. Not as dumb as you are. Shut up, seven of diamonds. Get back in the middle of the deck where you belong. What? You're only the six of spades. I'm one higher than you. At least I am not as crap as you. Who are you calling crap? Stop fighting, you're both idiots. You've got a lot of nerve. Who do you think you are? I never did like you, putting on airs like I shouldn't wonder. You're the one who interrupted when I was about to say my line. I can't believe you guys are arguing about this. Mind your own business. You want some? Now, they were fighting. Punching each other's numbers, knocking each other out. If all a card's numbers were hit, the card would go blank and fall over. The kings and queens were strangling each other, while the jacks hovered anxiously, eventually mobbed by the numbers. Card after card fell off the tower, fluttering down to the table. Soon the whole thing came crashing down in a heap. The four of hearts staggered upright on top of the pile, whispered, Tower Mina! and fell over. Barolo applauded. Then he gestured for the others to follow suit. Fugo reluctantly did, Sheila E did not. Without standing up, the card slid along the table and into Morolo's suit pocket. The show was over. What the shit? Sheila E said. Her stands reflect our own minds, very obviously in your case. So obsessed with pointless hierarchy, the actual fortune telling was half assed. It's not half assed! He said where they were! We know where Kokaki is hiding! Morolo puffed up his chest. Fugo put his chin on his hand, pondering this. Taormina's in Sicily, he said. That could pose a problem. Sicily usually did. Stan name, Manic Depression. Owner, Massimo Volpe, 25. Destruction, C. Speed, A. Range, E. Duration, B. Drugs last two weeks. Control, B. Potential, C. Power. Extreme acceleration of life energy. If used to alter salt, then melted and injected into the blood, provokes a powerful narcotic reaction in the brain, as effective or more effective than existing illegal drugs. This alteration remains temporarily when removed from the stand. If the stand's thorns pierce someone directly, their flesh reacts, their heart may burst, their organs may melt. The effects are many, making the stand unpredictable. Fugo. Sitting in the dark, Massimo Volpe couldn't help but ask again. Panacotta, Fugo. Mario Zucchero was draped on the chair in front of him like a wet shirt hung there to dry. Flattened out like this, he could barely produce any audible sounds at all, and none that he did formed recognizable words. Fortunately, Massimo had experience picking up on subtle movements in the flesh, and could understand what Zucchero said based solely on the way his lips fluttered. Enough about the time you fought Bucciolati's team. The point is, a man named Fugo was part of his team. Zucchero whimpered something. About the same age, then. I can't say I'd spared a single thought to him since he was expelled, but I can see him ending up in the mob. A faint whine. You saw Narancia and Fugo stands as the two greatest threats, so went after them first. That boy Narancia's already dead, Kokaki said. Giorno Giovanna made a generous donation in his name to a church in Naples. Same church where they held his funeral. But I've heard nothing like that for Fugo. So I guess that means he really is our enemy. So what? You guys were friends? Angelica asked. He didn't have any friends. Massimo laughed. He was conceited, stuck up, full of himself and had a terrible tempo. Yeah? Vittorio said. Worse than mine? Almost. I can't believe someone like him would ever be part of a team. Bucciolati moved up by earning Popo's favor, Kokaki explained. And one reason for that was that he had a man who could kill a lot of enemies very quickly. According to some pretty plausible rumors, anyway. People were afraid to go after him, and he took advantage of that. And that was Fugo, 
I can see that. He seemed like the type, somehow, pretending like he was studious, but hiding what he really thought. What's it like to fight a friend? Angelica asked. Like I said, he didn't have any. Angelica came wafting over to him and draped her arms around him. Oh, Massimo, why are you always frowning? Are you hungry? I'm not frowning. I've been wondering about something for a long time. I think you'd be cute if you smiled. Can you try for me? I'm smiling. See? No, I mean a real smile. She grabbed the corners of his phony grin and tried to pull them higher. No good, she muttered. A stream of blood escaped her mouth. Massimo wiped it away in silence. He called out manic depression and had it stroke her back. Angelica Atanasio had been born with a horrible blood disease. It made it feel like tiny needles were flowing through her veins. No medicine, no stand could make her feel healthy. Only Massimo Volpe had been able to free her from that pain to slow the progression of her sickness. Kokaki and Vittorio watched the two of them in silence. At last, Kokaki turned to Zakaro. If these fools could find us, we should assume a more powerful team is on the way. We may not be able to slip away. Then let's take the fight to them. I'll protect everyone, Vittorio proclaimed, waving his dagger. No, Kakaki said, his tone all business. You stay with Angelica and Massimo. I'll go. If Hugo's specialty is indiscriminate massacres, then I'm the best choice for the job. Hello everyone, welcome to the end of this very bizarre episode, which started with Sheila E's very melodramatic backstory, progressed to the Watchtower troop and just how crazy they are, had to do a lot of voices there, and my mic might have peaked a couple of times, so hopefully you guys will forgive me for that, and then finished with an incredible scene, in my opinion, between Angelica and Massimo, probably my favourite scene so far. I mean, just look at Manic Depression, it's this creepy weird stand, and it's the only thing that's keeping Angelica. Well, not alive, but feeling well, you know, especially with that scene where he calls out manic depression, specifically just to stroke her back and like comfort her. That's a, that's a very poetic scene in my opinion. And we see Angelica as like this very innocent girl who just wants to see Massimo smile because she thinks he'd look cute. And you know, th stuff like this makes these characters feel a bit more sympathetic rather than just the villain of this particular story. Anyway, we've got a lot more to say about this episode, so let's actually get onto that stuff. Firstly, uh, the chapter title is Me Voglio Fana Casa, of course, uh, ignoring my horrible Italian pronunciation, uh, which translates to I'd like to build a house by the sea. But the translation of that song, Me Voglio Fana Casa, is actually Sailor's Love. Like the English version of that song is called Sailor's Love. So yeah, the English title of this chapter is Sailor's Love. Kind of like an interesting detail I thought that I should share with you guys. To actually talk about the characters, last chapter we heard about Morolo's reasons for why he's doing this mission, why the people don't trust him, and it's because he was the one who gave the assassin team the burnt picture way back in Vento Oreo, and this was a question that was never answered during Vento Oreo. How exactly did the assassin team manage to get a burnt picture and somehow reconstruct it? And it turns out Marola was the one who did that. And I don't know, I feel like, especially in this chapter when we learned that Sheila E's sister was killed by Iluso, who was killed by Fugo, and you know, we saw Iluso in Vento Oreo, I feel like the author tries a little too hard to link the events of Purple Haze feedback with the events of Vento Oreo. Maybe kind of dialing that back a little would have been beneficial to the story being independent, um, not so reliant on having read part 5 to begin with. But you know, I think how the author does it isn't that bad, it's not like particularly forced, so I can excuse it, as long as the author just doesn't go crazy with it as the story progresses. The other thing that I quickly wanted to say was Diavolo's role in Pashone according to Giorno's leadership. So in this chapter they actually reveal that Diavolo is well known to the rest of Pashone and in the role of a leader. You know, they say that Diavolo had power, but then they also specifically point out that Diavolo wasn't the real boss, it was Giorno all along. So I'm kind of curious about what exactly Diavolo's role is stated to be in like this new Pashone. Was it just that he was one of Giorno's sub-commanders that was running a drug 
seem like underground, like he was doing it apart from Giorno's supervision? Is that the story that they've con concocted? Or is it that Pashone was involved with the drug thing and um, Diavolo was in charge of it and Giorno only later decided to crack down on it? It's really confusing and I wish they cleared that up, but they don't really. They don't really say anything else about it other than Diavolo was in charge of the drugs and then Bucciolati killed him and then all the drug stuff was finally exposed. So yeah, I I'm very curious about what exactly is going on there and hopefully the author kind of expands on that because this is kind of a pretty big plot point um, as to how Giorno actually managed to convince the rest of the gang that he has been the leader all along and still managed to let this drug trade that gave Passione so much power just like exist under his nose if he was so vehemently against it. The final thing that I want to touch on is the relationship between Fugo and Massimo. Last chapter, last video, Fugo explicitly says that Massimo was an old friend of his, but here Massimo says that Fugo had no friends. That's, a, that's an interesting distinction to make. I don't really know what that says about how the characters felt about the other person. I mean, did Massimo want to be friends with Fugo? Did Fugo want to be friends with Massimo? And then there was just kind of like this weird misunderstanding between them where no one really knew whether they um, were really expressing their true feelings, so neither of them thought they were really friends with each other or something. Um, but either way, you know, it's quite interesting that the author decided to make the protagonist and the antagonist, you know, knowledgeable about each other from their past. And it's not just a simple conflict that is, uh, person A has to go kill person B. Like a lot of Vento Oreo was, you know, like Bruno's team has to kill the assassin team just because they have to. Or the boss's elite defense squad has to kill Bruno's squad just because the boss ordered them to. You know, there's no personal conflict there. Um, and while I think Vento Oreo didn't need that, it's, it is interesting that uh, the author for Purple Haze Feedback is introducing that to um, part 5. Uh, I almost started talking about a part 6 relationship that kind of brought like past conflicts together, uh, but that's part 6 so I'm not going to talk about it. And so with all that being said, uh, thank you very much for listening. This video is a little bit late because of personal conflicts, so from here on out this might just end up being a weekly series every Sunday or every Monday or something, it will just come, a new chapter will come out. That will mean that this will end in a very long time, but it will mean that I'll be able to focus on my JoJo analysis videos. One of them should be coming out pretty soon, I just have to like record it and edit it, so maybe not that soon, but, but close enough guys, close enough. And so we come to the end of this chapter, if you enjoyed this video be sure to give it a like. Uh, share it around so it gets exposure. Be sure to subscribe if you're excited about more JoJo content and of course stay tuned for the next chapter which should be coming next week, hopefully. Take care guys.